untold centuries, people have drawn apart, drawn apart from the workday world to worship, to celebrate, to wonder at things beyond and within themselves. So we are gathered here to raise our sights, to look at new horizons. Life is more than toil for bread. Life has meaning. Life has purpose. As we celebrate life together, as we find our way during these challenging and confusing times, let us seek harmony within ourselves, with one another, and with that which is holy in this life, and find our lives uplifted and made whole. Wherever you are, join with me in saying amen. Good morning to you all. Good morning and welcome to our service here on March 7th at First Parish Church in Weston. I'm Jeff Barsnell and I'm privileged to serve as a minister here. We are glad that you could take a little bit of time to join us on this day. If you are new, if you have just happened upon us and our services, we welcome you. And if you are a longtime member and friend, we thank you for yet again tuning in. We strive to keep these services timely and hopeful with a little bit of something for everybody. We continue to miss the blessing, continue to miss the blessing of being gathered here in person to worship, to give thanks, to find some inspiration and come away renewed. Soon enough, soon enough, we hope to start gathering once again in body as well as in spirit. Our service participants this morning include Jeff Weeding, our organist, Rose Hegley, and Gabrielle Burkigia, our soloist, Bill Seno, our music director, and John and Karen Krolikowski, our chalice lighters. We also want to welcome to our sanctuary, Anthony Richards Sr. Mr. Richards is the executive director of an innovative after-school outreach and tutoring program in Boston called No Books, No Ball. We will look forward to hearing from him this morning. Our hymn for this day, is now is the time approaching. It can be found in the order of service. Uh, we will sing three verses of it, and that order of service can be found on our website, it was, and it was also emailed out to everybody yesterday. Please join with us in singing, Now is the Time Approaching.
Thank you, Gabrielle and Rose. I'd now like to call forward John and Karen Kralikowski, who will light our chalice on this day. Here on this first Sunday in March, we want to acknowledge how challenging this winter has been for many of us. Amidst the tensions of the pandemic and civil unrest, it can be difficult to keep one's spirits up. But springtime is coming and vaccinations are here. And with that, many more opportunities to greet one another in person and come together to make a difference. We light this, our chalice. As winter turns to spring, may we let the light shine on the outside and inside. Amen. Thank you, Karen and John. I would now like to introduce Janie Plank, a member of First Parish Church here in Weston, who will introduce our speaker, our guest speaker for this day. Good morning, my name is Janie Plank and I'm a part of a small group here at First Parish that has been focused over the last couple of months on identifying black and minority organizations and businesses in the Boston area that are making a positive and long lasting impact in their community. This effort was initially inspired by our support of Black Lives Matter as well as the severe economic impact that COVID-19 has had on communities in Boston. The intention of our small group and First Parish as a whole, is to provide financial grants to support those organizations or businesses that we feel will continue to make a real difference in the lives of those they serve and beyond. So it is in that vein that I'd like to introduce our guest speaker today, Mr. Tony Richards. Tony is a lifelong resident of Dorchester. He is the founder and executive director of No Books, No Ball, which was started 31 years ago. I certainly don't want to steal your thunder, Tony. So I'll just say your program is about way more than basketball. Welcome to the First Church in West First Parish Church of Weston and thank you for speaking and sharing your story with us today. And now the ball is in your court. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you and good morning. Uh, just first of all, I would like to thank the First Parish Church of Weston for inviting me to come tell the story of a program that I feel near and dear about No Books, No Ball. Um, uh, just briefly, you know, 30 plus years ago, um, my vision was just to pass on what has been passed on to me from you know, organizations and mentors that helped shape and mold my life as a young uh, young man in an environment of a city that was plagued with, you know, misfortunes and trials and tribulations. And just remembering all of the mentorship that wrapped around me as a young man and helped me stay out of the ill valleys of some of the troubles that were at our doorstep as a, you know, young man with, with in a household without a father and looking and seeking direction from male figures that we normally attach ourselves to, but they were positive role models that were in facilities, um, you know, in our neighborhood, uh, specifically recreation facilities. So when we took a love for basketball at that time and sports in general, it helped to create a atmosphere that helped mold us and create character that we tried to grow up with, some of us did, some of us didn't. What I always remembered as I got older was the lessons that we were taught and how I could have an impact when I was old enough to maybe having children of my own. Never thinking that far ahead, but just always remembering some of the life lessons and teachings that I was taught to be positive, to be productive, and to be have a given spirit so you can help the less fortunate. Fast forward, as I grew older and had children of my own, when my son was you know, an exception, I had to think about how I could have impact 
not just in his life, but in his friend's life and my nephew's lives and just community kids in general that was just seeking the same thing that I sought when I was an adolescent. And that was the inception of No Books, No Ball. When I identified that basketball was an attraction, and that's pretty much all it was, was an attraction to get kids in an environment to have a sports content and then use that as an atmosphere so we can instill values as adults. So my mission was to go and recruit coaches that had the same mindset that I had, that had the same values that I had, that had the same outlook of our future, of our community future that I had. And then that's where the basketball was attached to the circle of athletics to be able to teach kids value. And then I also thought that I wanted to add more to just the, the athletic concept and, and add some academic component so the kids would know that by them being a part of the athletic circle and we were giving them community you know, foundation as mentors, mentors, I just wanted to add some academics to the table so they would know that the athletic dream as they got older and they would chase the you know, potential scholarships as they became polished athletes that without academics, you know, having that as a support and foundation that the athletic dream wouldn't be possible. Because again, I, you know, uh, um, mimic the foundation that I came up on, watching a lot of the guys that I grew up with that had, were very skilled, very polished athletes, but when it came time to going on to the collegiate level, they, they just couldn't make it because of the academic foundation wasn't secured. That left them to play in park basketball and not being able to go to school on scholarships and not, you know, parents really, you know, in that income area didn't have the finances to finance kids, their children to go to college, somewhat like my own family. So, you know, that was the, again, some of the added value to No Books, No Ball, making sure that kids stayed eligible, kids had a requirement to know that if they didn't maintain a grade point average, they weren't eligible to play. And, and those values started at an early age level, at a seven, eight, nine, ten year old age level. So they carried those values on up into middle school, into high school, and into college. Um, you know, we've had a, we've been lucky enough to have a few kids that have crossed and, and attained the NBA, the professional basketball status. But those were kids that went to college on full scholarships. And I remember one, one individual, one of our first kids that end, end up being in, um, drafted into the NBA, his biggest pride was the fact that he graduated from college. He was a University of Connecticut graduate, a two-time um, uh, uh, you know, national championship uh, player at uh, UConn. But his pride, his biggest pride, uh, larger than the draft, he always prided the fact that he graduated with a degree from University of Connecticut. So those were values that we were, you know, luckily enough to instill into kids as they grew older and were able to save their parents' money, go on to higher learning levels, and when the basketball stops bouncing, they have something to fall back onto uh, education and potentially a career. Um, and, and just over the last 10 years, uh, from the 30 years that we've been in operation, my mission have been to give more than what we've been given so that we, we display that it's more than about basketball. You know, I wrap my arms around the community. We broaden our scope. We do. I've tried to create a mentorship program, especially with the older kids that are high school level, because I think they need to be uh, – you know, and not instructed, but educated more on that. It's about giving back and reaching some of the kids that are less fortunate, tying into your community. So when you're able to come back and give back, you have that mindset to do so. So, so with that, I've started some things with, you know, we go feed the homeless and in, in, in the less fortunate communities of Boston. Um, you know, we, I, I've taken them to jail visits. So they, you know, have an idea of what that other side looks like. If you don't make right choices, this is some of the, you know, some of the results of that bad decision making. 
Um, we've tied into feeding some of the community folks. You know, we do a big turkey giveaway every year where we invite families, you know, less fortunate families from throughout greater Boston areas. There's no restrictions, just if families are in need, they come and we try to serve. We do a big, you know, charitable um, Christmas toy drive where, you know, we try to identify families that are less fortunate, unable to provide services for the kids. And throughout this COVID is really, you know, educated folks on how much more we need to do as humans and as community. Um, so that's, that's been a real mission of mine over the last 10 years and it's, it's grown. Um, you know, I've been able to reward some of the older kids that participate in the mentorship program. So, you know, we try to take them to, you know, uh, Celtics games when I see their commitment to the mentorship program is, you know, uh, up to par and need to be rewarded. So, you know, but again, a large part of our you know, my core of coaches that I have now are kids that have played in the program when they were younger, when they were six, seven, eight years old. Now these kids are, you know, 20 plus years old, having children of their own. And my, my you know, pitch to them always is, you want your children to be involved in a program that had impact, like the program had impact in your life. So we all, from every community, every city, just like Weston, we want this generation to be better than the last one. We just want to leave, you know, this earth with making sure that we had impact and we made the space better than it was when we attained the space. When we walked into the space, hopefully it's better when we leave this space. Uh, and every generation, I think, will be strengthened and bettered and we're in a better, a better life. So thank you again for having me. Um, uh, it's been an honor and, and, you know, it's my first time visiting this area, this church particularly. Um, but, but God bless you all and appreciate the invite. Thank you.
Amen. Thank you, Rose, Gabrielle, and Jeff for a, a fantastic, fantastic performance there. I'm not sure how that came across on video, but for those of us fortunate enough to be here live, that sounded great, so thank you. Our reading for this day, our reading comes from the Gospel according to Matthew. It comes from the 22nd chapter. Starting in the chapter just before, Matthew tells the story of Jesus entering triumphantly into Jerusalem. And then there are these four intervening chapters before the Passion begins, where Jesus is arguing and debating with the Sadducees and the Pharisees, the, the priests and the religious teachers uh, in and around Jerusalem, and, and telling and sharing um, several very famous parables and teachings with his followers. I want to read you a section of Matthew chapter 22 about the greatest commandment. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked Jesus a question in order to test him. Teacher, he said, teacher, which commandment is the, in the law is the greatest? And Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all of the law and the prophets. Here ends the reading. I want to begin this morning by thanking Tony Richards for his presentation. The No Books, No Ball program provides an important service to the Boston community in Roxbury and Dorchester. It has been heartening, heartening to learn about this innovative program and how Coach Richards and his staff and volunteers work with these kids to encourage a mastery of sports and sportsmanship to foster decency and responsibility, and to create community. They provide a caring, supportive environment where kids can grow and learn and what it means to be a person of integrity in this sometimes difficult world. So thank you, Coach Richards. Thank you for being with us this day and for sharing your story and work with those of us here in person. And the many more of us, the many more of us who are watching at home from a distance. I find, I find that we human beings are herding mammals. That's H-E-R-D, not hurt, but herd. Our lives only make sense and can only really develop and flourish in the context and presence of other people. All of us benefit, all of us benefit at different times in our lives from the caring and the wise support of mentors and peers, there can be no doubt. And all of us benefit from being reminded that our blessings often arise from the goodness and the kindness of others. I would add, I would add that there is a larger kindness and larger goodness that we can encounter on our own as well. Some of us call this God or the Lord or the sacred while others might wish to refer to it as our higher power or the spirit, perhaps Brahman or Bodhicitta for those of you informed by Hinduism and Buddhism. 
in a way, in a way, that is what we do in a place, in a community like this church. We encourage one another to practice those social and those spiritual activities that help us become better, more loving, more decent people. Here at First Parish Church, I am regularly reminded to try to be my best self in my work in this community and in my daily devotional practice of reading and meditation, journaling and prayer. It's both the social dimension of being in community with other people and the personal dimension of opening myself up to some larger transcendent reality that inspires me to grow and to serve and to try to make a difference. Like the disciplines of, I don't know, playing basketball and doing homework, there is enormous value, enormous value in setting aside some regular time, some regular time each day or week for devotion, for rumination, for contemplation. It's my observation that those who commit to such a practice find themselves more easily able to manage the vicissitudes of life, those inevitable highs and lows that we all experience. They also lovingly and sometimes courageously challenge the ways of our world. And right now I think we need, we need more people like that. I'm reminded of the story that many of us have been reading about over the last few days. Perhaps you've heard about it. Pope Francis did something somewhat daring and historic this week. He visited Iraq. That's right, the head of the largest Christian church in the world, the leader of one of the most wealthy religious organizations in the West, decided to visit the war-torn, predominantly Muslim country of Iraq. He was the first pope ever to visit this country and set foot on the soils of what was ancient Babylon. I would be willing, I'd be willing to bet that many Western countries, including the United States, attempted to dissuade the Pope from embarking upon such a dangerous trip, especially to this country, to this region of the world where there are not that many Christians. Lest we forget, there was a ballistic missile attack on a U.S. base in Iraq just a month or so ago. And lest we forget, there are people in that country and in that region who detest the United States and the West for what has transpired there over the last two to three decades. Even in the most optimistic of appraisals, I think most of us would agree that our country's hands are not entirely clean when it comes to the untractable conflicts in that area of the world that persist. So the Pope's visit this week was intended to ease tensions, not ratchet them up. There is in Iraq a minority Christian community who live under the difficult rule of the majority Shia Muslim government. And while some, some of this Christian minority are Roman Catholic, there are also some there who are Syrian Orthodox Christians. These are people who, whose families have been there in that region of the world for 1,200 or more years. Where was your family 1,200 years ago? I don't know about you, but I, I don't think I could say. Somewhere in Northern Europe, maybe. I have no idea. These people know. The Syrian Orthodox Church is one of the most ancient churches in the world. So the Pope's visit, the Pope's visit was intended to help this Christian minority in Iraq by showing the Arab region that the world is watching them. But it appears that the trip was also, is also intended to open up channels of dialogue with Shia Muslims in Iraq and Iran. The Pope declared that he was there because religion must serve the cause of peace and unity. He also stated several times that Iraq's religious diversity is a precious resource, not an obstacle to eliminate. A message he reportedly shared directly with the Grand Ayatollah Ali Sistani when they met yesterday, I believe. 
and a message I would argue that he could also share with many, many millions of evangelical Christians in this country right now. Now, I mention this here not because I'm a huge fan of the Pope or someone who espouses the tenets of the Roman Catholic Church, although I do have to say, I do have to say that this may very well be the most dynamic and engaged and open-hearted Pope that I have seen in my lifetime. Rather, I hold up this story. I hold up this story because this is a sort of courageous and compassionate action that someone with a real and vital devotional life is capable of. I am sure I would disagree with Pope Francis on all manner of theological questions, as would many of you, but I nonetheless see in his choices, in his actions, the fruits of the Spirit. I see in his decisions the signs, the signs of someone who takes seriously Jesus' teaching about the greatest commandment that we heard in our reading this morning, namely that you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. I see someone who has put into practice those commandments in his own life, or at least has tried to, deeply and personally, and is now finding ways that he can foster goodwill and mutual understanding in a part of the world that has only known hatred and strife and war for far too long. And by doing this, by doing this, he is living up to the ancient title of that office that he now holds, that of Pontifex, or bridge builder. There is something, there is something that changes in our lives when prayer happens, when it really happens. And when I say prayer, I mean a practice, a practice of a regular, consistent, and intentional devotional life. I refer to the practices of prayer and meditation, of journaling and chanting and singing and stretching and breathing and other activities that we do in the privacy of our own lives that connect us, connect us to some greater presence or force or energy in this life and remind us of the needs of our own souls. That, that is what Jesus is talking about in this famous passage that we heard. That's what loving the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind deals with. This is not some fleeting occasional thought and notion. It's not a theory, but rather it's an intentional and ongoing set of practices and activities. Mystics and religious teachers down through the ages have taught and encouraged various means and ways of doing this. And we all need to find ways to connect to something larger than ourselves in order to truly find ourselves. Augustine of Alexandria, way back in the sixth century, made this case quite poignantly. He declared, for thee we were made, O God, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in thee. Until they find their rest in thee. Developing an active devotional life, setting aside regular time each day or each week for prayer, for meditation, for journaling, for reflection, is what opens the door to transformation in many of our lives. Over time, we find our perspectives transformed. We find our burdens lightened. We find our hopes invigorated. We find our willingness to engage with a sometimes difficult world emboldened. Over time, the regular practice of a devotional life reconnects us, reconnects us to what is most important in our lives. It reminds us of our deepest, most cherished values. And out of these devotional practices, out of these practice, practices can come new and better decisions and responses in our lives. 
Out of this practice comes consideration of the second greatest commandment, which is to love our neighbors as ourselves. And this then often leads us to further consideration and contemplation. There is, there is in what Jesus stated a process. There is a cycle at work, that of looking inward and then acting outward and then looking inward and then looking again outward. And this cycle develops and emerges when prayer happens, when real prayer happens in our lives. And again, when I say prayer, I mean some devotional practice that calms our minds, that restores our souls, that allows us to find our center in the present moment. I know that for some of us, for some of you, depending on your experience, depending on the path that you have led, traditional God language can be a hindrance to this practice. In those cases, simply focusing on our breath simply clearing our minds, simply cultivating goodwill towards others, simply taking a few minutes to dwell on what is important in this life, work quite well as well. Like playing basketball, like doing our homework, a real devotional life is not always easy. It's not always convenient. There are days when we do not want to engage in any quiet, engage in any devotional time. And yet we find that the regular practice of considering what is good and holy in this life helps us in ways that we cannot, cannot anticipate over time. It ever so slightly shifts, shifts our perspective and decision-making for the better. The writer, the writer and business consultant, Catherine Neald, points out in her wonderful little book on the devotional life, a thousand times a day, a thousand times a day, we are faced with the choice of responding from our best selves from some other part of our makeup. And if you are like most people, the ratio of best self choices to other self choices is often low. She goes on to note that what people have discovered over time is that as they carry out their spiritual practice, as they put in the work, that ratio of best self to lesser self choices improves. For in a daily spiritual practice, we are visiting this place where love and our best self reside. <laughs> visiting this place, making this making time for this quiet reflection, carving out a few minutes in our busy lives for reflection on our cherished values. This is how we find what is sacred in this life. This is how we love the Lord our God with all of our heart and with all of our soul and with all of our mind. I would like to think, I would like to think that it is out of this ongoing practice of both together and individually working, that we find ourselves where we are as a congregation here in 2021. So many people and so many churches are struggling these days. It is so easy, so easy right now to get caught up in the challenges and the soap operas of our own individual lives and concerns. And yet we here at First Parish are intentionally turning our attention outwards to the needs and the well-being of others. And as we consider, consider the many ways we have been blessed, as we wake up to the privileges and benefits that many of us have enjoyed in our lives, as we come to terms with the concerning levels of inequality that we perceive in our society, we are now asking ourselves anew how we can be a blessing how we can be a blessing in the lives of others. We are now asking how we can make a difference, how we can help our community and region and world. What words, what actions can we offer now and in the coming days that foster some goodwill and compassion? 
These sorts of questions are the ones that can be posed, but never fully answered. Rather, like in our individual lives, we must live into those questions. What does it mean? What does it really mean in our actual lives, day in and day out, to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our souls, with all of our minds? What does it mean to even do it a little bit, not the whole way, all of our, with all of our heart, with all of our souls, and with all of our minds? I am grateful, grateful to be part of a community that is asking these sort of questions and trying to live out our answers. I'm reminded of the words by the Unitarian Universalist scholar and writer and minister, Rebecca Parker. She says, your gifts, your gifts, whatever you discover them to be, can be used to bless or to curse the world. The mind's power, the strength of the hands, the reaches of the heart, the gifts of speaking and listening and imagining and seeing and waiting. Any of these can serve to feed the hungry, to bind up the wounds, to welcome the stranger, to praise what is sacred, to do the work of justice, or offer love. And any of these can also draw down the prison door, hoard bread, abandon the poor, obscure what is holy, and comply with injustice and withhold love. You must answer this question. What will you do with your gifts? Choose to bless the world. The choice to bless the world is more than an act of will. It is a moving forward into the world with the intention to do good. It is an act of recognition. It is a confession of surprise. It's a grateful acknowledgement that in the midst of this broken world, unspeakable beauty and grace and mystery abide. There is an embrace of kindness that encompasses all life even ours. May it be so. Amen. And now I invite you to say along with me the version of the Lord's Prayer found in your order of service. God who is over all, and yet inside each and every one of us, we honor your name. May you rule in all hearts everywhere. We pray for our daily food and to be forgiven of our wrongdoing, even as we forgive the wrongdoings of others. Guide us through temptation and protect us from evil. And all dominion and power and glory be yours forever. Amen and amen. Many of you have inquired about how you can support First Parish Church and our work here and around the region, especially when we are not gathered here in person on Sundays. As we like to say, you can do so three ways. You can mail in a check to the church office. That works very well. You can log into your bank account online and set up a one-time or periodic donation to First Parish Church. That's my favorite approach. Or you can use our PayPal account. And the easiest way to do that is to have a PayPal account yourself and then to go to our website and simply click on the donate button at the top of the home page. And from there, you will see a link to our PayPal account online. Regardless of the option you choose, we are grateful to you, the members and friends of this community, for continuing, continuing to support our church's voice and presence and mission. What we do here matters. What we do here is making a difference, and it's worthy of our support.
Thank you for joining us today. We invite you to check out our upcoming gatherings and programs, including our virtual fellowship hour that begins at 1130 today on Zoom. In addition, our social justice task force will be meeting today at 1 p.m. also on Zoom. This week, we will host our regular programs, including Knitters and Stitchers on Monday at noon, and our Wednesday morning meditation program <coughs> at 8.30 a.m. In addition, the Standing Committee, our board, will have its monthly meeting this Tuesday at 7.30 p.m. Next Sunday, next Sunday, we have a busy day. We will we'll be hosting a public lecture and program featuring the journalist and well-known author Robert Kuttner, who is the editor of The American Prospect. The title of his address will be Pathways to a More Just Economy. Can we join ethics and economics? The program is hosted by our Committee on Adult Ministry and Programs and underwritten by the McMullen Rush Fund. It will begin at 4 p.m., also on Zoom. In addition, Willard Lett, the New England Region Director for the Unitarian Universalist Association, will be on hand next Sunday during fellowship hour at 11.45 a.m. to greet us and provide a brief update about some programs and uh, ongoing activities at the UUA. Our book group continues to meet and will be gathering again on Thursday, March 18th at 9.30 a.m. They will be discussing the Wright brothers by the well-known historian David McCulloch. There are links to all of our online meetings and programs in the e-newsletter that was sent out yesterday and on the calendar page of our website. Finally, I want to thank Tony Richards Sr. for joining us today and sharing with us his inspiring work with No Books and No Ball. We continue. We continue to discover many ways that we can participate as members of an active community from a distance. I'm gratified, I continue to be gratified to see so many of you stepping up and reaching out during these difficult times. That is what churches like ours do. Thank you for joining us this day. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord keep all those whom you love, whether here or in some other place. May God be your companion and you be God's friend as you walk together through all the days of your life. And at the journey's end, may you find the welcome of God's love. It keeps us all. Amen.
Reichel. And I'm Jacob Bars Snell. Thank you for joining us this week. As part of the AV team here, we try to make these services interesting and enjoyable for everyone involved. And I'm Jacob Bars Snell. These services are made possible because of viewers like you. Thank you. Uh, um, and I'm Jacob Bars Snell. <laughs>